Right oh. Uh, thanks everyone for coming today. It's a <clears throat> nice, beautiful day. It'd be much nicer to be outside doing something else and enjoying the sun, but um, you're here listening to me drone on, so um, I suppose it's uh, time to start, hey? I've got to work out where to point this because everyone's had a battle. Looks like I'm going to have one too if I don't turn it on. There we go. So, anyone know what that is? Anyone? Anyone? It's an icebreaker, yes. So I'm a good UTAS student and when I was taught how to do presentations, I was told you always start a presentation with an icebreaker. So uh, I thought this was a pretty cool one. It's a tough crowd, Jesus. <laughs> I get my nerves up. So I've got to work out this button. Right, today's chat. Basically, I'm going to summarise how drones got cool because they are pretty cool. Uh, common types of drones that you'll be exposed to and see and probably getting services offered to you for. Uh, some of the uses, some of the sensors that go underneath them, the various capacities of them. I'm going to run through the workflow of how a drone generates data and makes things and uh, then go on to the accuracy of this data and why it actually matters. Do you have to give a stuff is the ultimate question for a lot of this stuff. And then implementing precision ag workflows or precision ag processes into your farm because it's kind of one of these catch cries that rolls off the tongue but it's actually really hard to implement into your business. So basically my journey into the world of drones um, <clears throat> and how I got here was really a culmination of some perfect timing. I'd spent basically 20 years of my life destroying radio controlled planes and I have a big pile of junk of busted up ones and I loved it. I was passionate about flying. I was running a scenic gliding business out of Hobart while I was meant to be doing my degree at UTAS as an undergrad and having a good old time. And I love my flying, love computer games and uh, simulators in particular, making you know sim models and all that sort of stuff. Um, I enjoy data as well, mining data and looking for patterns and, and analysis and things, something that, I don't know, floats my boat, which seems a bit odd. And... Uh, I was also driving the tractor and I loved burning a bit of diesel and I loved auto steer and being sit back on Facebook and have your sections turn on and off and I thought that's cool but surely I can do some more with this big investment. And drones basically came along at the right time for me and it culminated all these little passions of mine into, into one neat little package, you know, it's something that flies, it's radio control, it can make your tractor do cooler things and uh, you get a lot of data to play with. So off I went down that path and... Uh, became a commercial drone pilot six years ago. So basically how did drones get cool? How did all this kick off? And this is it. These are the two things that really made drones become a household name. You got the Nintendo Wii on the left and the iPhone on the right. The iPhone, everyone got one. It had a whole heap of accelerometers in it. So when you wiggled it around, it'll get your movement and things. It had a GPS in it as well. So suddenly you got mass produced, miniaturized componentry flooding the Chinese market with components and copiers and stuff. So the next wicked thing was the Wii and you know most age groups have had a go of the Nintendo Wii. It's another thing full of miniaturised accelerometers so when you swing that tennis racket or do that big drive down the pitch it senses your movement of your hand and your body and puts it into a digital context in a computer game on the screen. So it's, it's measuring what the heck's going on and you can do something cool with it. So the nunchuck, the one that nobody uses that much unless you're doing the boxing thing on the Wii, actually had a really nice sized little chipset in it and a little mini computer and all these accelerometers and some ports that you could make it do things. And this little thing up here is a Nintendo nunchuck. I ruined my first one by pulling it apart, split it in half, a little bit of soldering. This board here is from the bottom of the nunchuck and that's uh, all the accelerometers. And down the bottom you've got your little computer there that you can actually program. So you've got these little bits put together. Then you ended up with all these cheap GPS modules. Instead of spending hundreds of hundreds of dollars on them, you could buy something for about 70 or 80 bucks and plug it into that Wii board and get some control. So suddenly things were getting cheaper. And then some cool people came along and wrote a bit of code for it and um, not my forte to put it mildly. And we had this little really crude graphical user interface set up and you could take all the data, those squiggly graphs of the accelerometers and rather than making you do the perfect drive on the Wii, it was controlling a drone, a quadcopter down here. So you could make it control things and do things, use that information to make it do something. So all of a sudden, we had affordable drones. We had a Nintendo nunchuck for 26 bucks, and we had a GPS module for about $65. Plug it in, do your head in on some forums trying to learn some code, 
and you had a drone that could fly. I mean, my first one was 12 mil sticks of wood, zip ties, and a Tupperware container my wife didn't know I'd borrowed. And uh, this, this kicked off, and it went off. It went off online. It went absolutely crazy. There's forum groups, and all us nerds really rejoiced. And it was kind of a cool time. And as I said, it sort of it was about that time where I found out I combined everything I was into. So I'm still battling this pointer. 2011 marked the birth of the nerd drone. And uh, there's a nerd with his drone in a poppy paddock. And uh, probably the once we suddenly got these multi-rotors flying, there was always a way to transmit video to goggles. And so first-person video, this drone racing thing, kind of is what really tickled my fancy. And, you know, I could build a drone for under 200 bucks and fly it around and look at my poppy paddock from above and look at problems and take photos and, and have a good old time as well seven years ago. So not that long ago, you couldn't do it. And I'm calling 2015 the year of the consumer drone. That was the Christmas where everyone had to have one. And the thing that really made it kick off was, was this yellow thing, the ubiquitous image of a drone, the, the DJI Phantom and uh, 3DR Solo was the other competitor for it. So everyone wanted one that Christmas and most people bought them. They've got a GPS in them. If everything goes pear-shaped, you let go of the sticks and it stays there within about a metre, it's not a problem. You've got a high-definition video feed that you just plug your smartphone in, you don't need antennas and all this analog stuff and channel selection. It all, it all just happened. So the consumer drones really only kicked off two years ago. It really became a big thing. And 2016 is the year everyone had a drone, is how I'd term it. So, you know, this year everyone seems to have a drone. So the rush and the rapid evolution of this scene, of this automation, is really only five or six years old. It's not that old. So all these different types of drones and stuff, they always existed. They were always out there in the realm of military and stuff and, and helicopters and things. But it, the automation and those flight controllers were thousands of dollars worth of investment. And if you pranged it, you were pretty heartbroken. Whereas if you pranged mine, you put some new zip ties on it, Tupperware did its job and maybe you had to solder something up. So all of a sudden you could really experiment with airframes and push your luck and have a red hot crack. So I'm just going to run through some of the typical drones. So Quadcopters or multi-rotors, they can be any size, um, from three motors up to 12 if you want, depending on what you want to do with them. This is a big endurance one we built, flies for 50 minutes, uh, doesn't handle much wind, but very handy to get over sort of 60 hectares in a job. The next type we get are the, uh, I'm pushing the range on this, aren't I? Foam fixed wings. This is like your conventional aircraft. It's uh, got lots of control surfaces. It's got the ailerons, the rudders, the elevators, Lots of things to control and go wrong. Looks like a conventional aeroplane and you can fill it up with your payload. Next type of these delta wings or flying wings. Uh, just two controllers on the back, so two flapperons or elevons here. So you can roll, pitch, do all your flight controls with just two servos. So it's only two things to fail, two control surfaces to rip off. Big sweeping wings so you can crash it into the ground and it'll bounce back up and quite robust and tough. Payload goes in the centre, motor tucked up the back. So that's what we call a flying wing, and it's probably the most common and most successful airframe design going. Then you've got VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing. These ones are a crowd pleaser. Uh, my children do look slightly concerned at what Kyle's invented here. But uh, it's a petrol engine with a wingspan, and that thing will fly for an hour and a half. Uh, but the problem is it takes, because it's flying fast, it needs quite a bit of ground to take off. So if you're in the southwest or somewhere, or somewhere rough, you basically turn it into a helicopter. So it's got four motors here. On it so we can take off like a helicopter and then rev up the gas engine transition into forward flight fly for an hour and a half come back over our heads transition into a hover and then land in front of us again and uh, very handy in certain situations other times it can be a pain but um, basically what I'm trying to say there is one type of drone doesn't suit every task no matter what you think it's going to do the payload varies, the utilisation varies of what you're trying to do, the, the weather and climate you're going to fly it in, the ability of the automation and the controlling. Do you want it to be simple or do you want to be able to really tune it out to do cool things? Something you consider. And lastly, what are you trying to do with it? You know, yeah, it's cool, yeah, it's a crowd pleader, but what are you trying to do with it? And that's the core question that I'm going to try and help you guys answer today. So. I've divided into two groups, which sort of parallels with the demonstrations and this talk. So the top one's this inspection work, scouting, that sort of stuff. So going out with the drone, using the video feed to look from above, get a different perspective, take photos, make some video, you know, have fun with it and enjoy it. And that's 
That's one type of drone work for, for agriculture. The second one is this precision ag work or this, this PA workflow, which is your variable rate maps, your, your drainage maps, uh, NDVI, all that sort of stuff. And that's what my talk's going to focus around to help you guys kind of worm through because that's where you can really pizzle away your money before you know what's happened. So the drone is only a tool to gather data. You know, it's like saying your farm is run by its tractor. It's, you know, that's the thing that's got the stereo and the big engine and you do that. But what you hook up to the back is what does the job and makes the quality of the job that you're doing. And no two implements do the same job. So that's the sensor. It's what you hook up to the back of that tractor. And that's one of the key things to consider here. And we're going to go into that a bit. But the biggest thing to drive home today is accuracy, both relative and absolute. So it's a bit jargon heavy, sorry. But the, the relative accuracy is, is referring to like if you take a map, within that map, that image, that snapshot in time, when you just look at that as a single thing, is it relatively accurate? How accurate is it? And we'll do some examples later, but how accurate is that relative to itself? And absolute accuracy is how accurate is that map against other time points and other measurements? And so say your, your spatial accuracy of is this thing exactly where you say it is relative to the national survey grid? So when you send a tractor in with a GPS system, it'll actually go to where you're trying to tell it to go. That's, that's absolute accuracy. Or you're trying to look at a map, NDVI map, across a growing season, is it actually measuring the same amount of reflectance and things each season, each image? So that relative and absolute accuracy is an important thing to try and wrap your head around. And basically, a wise old precision ag guru told me when I first got hyped up on this, he said, you know, farmers, farmers know where the problems are, they're just not very good at drawing lines around them. And in essence, that's what we're doing in precision ag. We're just drawing a more defined, more confident line around the problems you already know exist. So the key questions there with drones and drone data, basically you've got to ask yourself uh, what do you want to collect? What, what, are, you trying to, what are you trying to do there? Um, next question is can you use the data once you get it? It's all very well and good to have an expensive pretty picture but if you can't action it, it what's the point in it? So that leads you into then how are you going to implement it? If, if you create a variable rate spreading map but you're insistent on using your own spreader but you don't have variable rate spreading, was, was it a good investment or can you go and look at a service provider who can come in with variable rate in their truck and, and put it on for you? So, you know, looking at that question and just thinking, am I willing to pay that extra and not use that spreader I've got repayments on? That, that kind of consideration and you'll be surprised how many people overlook that sort of thought process. How confident are you the data is good? Now, this is, this is the million dollar question, you know, ignorance is bliss. If you've got no idea, oh, mate, she's brilliant, trust me, I know boats, this is, this is what you've got to do. And uh, that's called a sales pitch and media hype. And wading through that is building up your confidence in this precision ag space of, of what you're getting. And that last point is there is the sniff test. To you as the farmer who knows the paddock well or the agronomist, does this map that this guru who's trying to sell you a drone package, does it make sense to what you sort of know what's happening in that paddock? Which leads back to that argument about drawing lines around problems. So. This is how the drones make maps. It's, a, it's an age-old process that's been around since aerial reconnaissance called photogrammetry. So the drone basically, it's got your sensor, it's got some kind of automation, it takes off, it flies along, does a grid, takes lots of photos. And um, the key thing is it's got a GPS tag. So each time a photo is taken, it's got some GPS data which tells that photo where it is in the world. And then you go out and collect some ground control points, some fence posts or put some mats out as a reference to see if your absolute accuracy is actually spot on or how bad you're going. So enough of the words, we're going to pretty pictures now. Basically up here we've got all these blue, this is a mapping mission of a 140 hectare corner of a pig pivot and all those blue squares are images of photos. And then you've got the stick sticking up, that's actually telling us the axis and the position of that camera when it took that photo, its height and its position. So that's that GPS tag. And that's the critical component. Down below is all the individual photos. And then what we're trying to do is you can stitch them together, just, just make a 2D, stitch the photos, it looks about right map. Or you can use what we call this um, triangulation. So you take each one of those photos and they overlap uh, anywhere from sort of five to nine times. And in those overlaps, you'll find one pixel which matches in all those other images. And because you've got the GPS position and you know about the camera sensor and the lens, you can actually, with a bit of trigonometry, triangulate that pixel and say exactly where it is in the world. Then you go to the other nine photos 
and they all match up and they compute that one pixel and say this pixel is at the following lat long and elevation. So that's the crux of photogrammetry in making a drone map. And what it does is create this thing called a dense point cloud. These are all dots. Um, you can do it in black and white, but the colour looks cooler. So these are all, it's about 600 photos, and this is how many points. There's millions of points in here that they found overlap, and they put a GPS tag on it, and they're all dots. And you can roughly make out sort of what it is. The next step is then a, a triangular mesh, where we join up the dots. So we take the imagery and the colour values and everything between those dots and make assumptions and create a pretty skin. So that's a quarry site there, and it creates what we call a digital surface model. So we take the point cloud and then make this surface model. And you can do this, you know, with cameras out of planes, with satellites, with everything. So once you start overlaying images, you get a three-dimensional construct. And, and this is your, your digital surface model, your, the, the base of your map. So um, I use this slide to kind of demonstrate the kind of the, the pathway of making these maps. So here's on the left is, a, is your, your bare earth map, your, your RGB, your colour photo as such, super accurate. Then you go into modified cameras, the raw data. Then you start manipulating it into NDVI through to variable rate application maps. So it kind of shows you start here at photogrammetry, making maps, start analysing through to endpoints. So it's just kind of a, a way to visualise what we're trying to do here with, with the drones. So life on the button, I'm just not nailing this today. But um, oh, look at that. So digital surface model. When you get this, this texture, this 3D texture, you can start taking measurements from it because it's, if it's accurate, you can go and do things. So this is a gravel pile we pushed out and we've drawn a box around the, the stockpile and we've actually just calculated how much gravel we pushed out. So there's 2,025 cubic metres, plus or minus about 8%. So with a quick drone flight, we can measure how much gravel we pushed out, take the dozer bill, work out how much it's cost us to get that gravel out. Just a cheap, simple little cost of production style calculator. So you can then take all sorts of measurements from area, slope and gradient, plan out where pivot wheels go, can it go across that bank, can a vehicle safely drive up that. You know, you can, you, your mind's the limit on this sort of stuff. And taking the next step from these digital surface models these, these, uh, and point clouds is, is the trick to developing a precision ag workflow. So digital terrain models are a great example. You can smooth out all those trees and lumps and bumps and create a contour map of what's happening. And you can uh, then start doing other things from that. You can start building upon this layer of information. You can, it's the foundations of your variable rate application maps. You know, a, a basic NDVI map like that, we can then start tweaking up to be a variable rate spreading map or a variable rate spray map for your reglone or growth regulators. You know, more regulators in this dark, this, this yellowy area where the crop's vigorous, less regulator in here. So this catches up. You know, it's, it's the building blocks and it's essential to have good building blocks in this game. Another great one, and probably the, the biggest bang for your buck with drone data, is using that digital surface model and then going and doing things like drainage simulation. So, so this is a um, 170 hectare site. Uh, the reds and greens are the contours showing height, so the water's draining out that way, but it's very flat. There's a 0.7% gradient across it. And uh, you can take that model and then go and add a simulation of rainfall onto it, and you can basically say a 60 mil rain event, what will happen? And it will predict the water will move across the paddock into here and the white areas are where the water accumulates. So where you've got white patches is where water's going to sit and not actually flow. So suddenly you've got your surface model of what's happening with water flow. And most farmers, when we go into this, particularly if it's a younger, you know, younger generation pumped up on it and the older generation is very experienced with the site, they'll say, I bloody know all that. But um, <laughs> I hear that pretty often. But, you know, they know all that. But the thing is, this is a computer model and we've simulated what they know. We've got something there. Now, to drain that, it's a one kilometre ditch to dig. You know, how many thousands will that cost? I can tell you now, it costs a cup of coffee to go and click and draw in a drain in, the, in this digital surface model and rerun that model and say, does this drain work at 1% gradient, 2% gradient, 3% gradient? Do I do lateral drains? How many lateral drains? How many tile drains? You can suddenly start simulating and playing with the data to actually develop something out of it. So with that in mind, you've got to think about this accuracy concept and why it matters. So it depends on what you want that data to do and what you're trying to do. So 
the old uh, Snapchat, you know, it's a pretty quick and happy thing that theoretically you can't get screen grabs of. But um, free-to-air GPS on a drone, tagging those photos, all overlaid and stitched together, okay? You can have a five-metre error on GPS, free-to-air, doesn't sound too bad. Go and layer that over with nine photos with a five-metre error, that can be a 45-metre error. So your gate, which you thought was here, on the maps over there, that it morphs itself. And, you know, you look at this good-looking rooster here, that the hair looks right, the shirt looks normal, but there's a bit of distortion going on. And a lot of these uh, services that are asking you to upload into a cloud and get your map back in 30, 30 minutes just like that are doing this. It, it, it's distortion and it looks good, looks nice, you're happy and you smile when you see it, but is it actually accurate? And there's a lot of data to show it usually isn't. So free-to-air GPS and stitching and stuff doesn't actually give you a good result. So the way to combat that is then to add ground control points, and I call this the Instagram effect. So, you know, it looks, it looks quite good. I, I think I look good. But um, you can see there's a bit of filtering going on on the side here. There's a little bit of distortion and, and things aren't quite right. But the difference in there is you take your free-to-air GPS and then you add ground control points. So you place a mat, you measure it with a two-centimetre accurate GPS, you assemble that point cloud, and then you take the pixel on that mat and say, I know this point is at this spot, and it will correct that model to give it some good relative accuracy. So away from Snapchat and Instagram, I'll go to some actual data. Um, this is a, a map of accuracy. What RMSE error is a measurement in centimetres of, of error. So here we've got uh, 10, 20, up to 80 centimetres. We've got on this left-hand side a drone-based typical camera sensors that are flown in drones. And over here is the, the run-of-the-mill photogrammetry benchmark. So these guys with ground control points of two, three and five of the colours, these guys just nail it. And it's only because the big cameras dedicated to it and only take like six photos, so the error doesn't propagate much, and they're done with an RTK GPS. So these guys are consistent even with or without ground control points. In contrast, drones with two ground control points, and this is on quite a small area, 190 acres, so 75 hectares, two ground control points, the height factor is out by 70 centimetres. So that's, that's, you know, just shy of my waist in error. And you're going to do a drainage plan on that? You go to three, you know, you go, oh, add more ground control points. That's easy. Well, here, yep, the Sony at 200 foot, it works. At 400 foot, it doesn't work. There's this huge level of variation. And it says here, oh, yeah, go place five. Yep, that's the answer. And everything gets sub 10 centimetres. So, yep, you can do it. <clears throat> but I'll tell you what, there's an art to getting that right. So to try and move away from that thing, the, the, the GPS accuracy is a summary. Pretty much free to air with no GPS is distorted to hell. It looks pretty, it's prompt, and you, you, know, you can do it just like that. Low counts GCPs are poorly positioned as well, so the art of photogrammetry is a trade, it's a profession, um, and hacks with a drone do struggle to learn it, it takes a while. You get there, you get better accuracy, but it can be highly varied. Then you go to well positioned, high count, ground control points, it's time consuming and a headache, you can actually get there. You can be on the, on the benchmark. But the actual true way to do it with the UAV and achieve these industry benchmarks of, of survey equivalent is to basically go to what we call this RTK or, or PPK trigger. So rather than trying to put mats out in the paddock and stuff, you actually, every time the camera's triggered, it's got a two centimetre accurate timestamp on it. So you're being really accurate and that's specialised sort of stuff and it's not in your free-to-air GPS. Uh, so the image gets taken with that, and then you actually still go out and lay down mats and measure those to validate, and that's how you start chasing that absolute accuracy, is getting those things to all line up. So, sorry it was a bit heavy on it, but um, that's your, your spatial accuracy in a nutshell. And NDVI is the other thing farmers get very hyped up on, this crop health vigour mapping, that sort of stuff. So, here you've got dead leaf, stress leaf, healthy leaf. The big one is near infrared. So this is this near-infrared photography, measuring reflectance of near-infrared. When a leaf is slightly stressed, the green's still there, and the near-infrared's nowhere near as active. When a healthy leaf, green's down. So that's that concept, okay? We want to measure the reflectance of near-infrared. Healthy plants reflect more. How do you measure it? So we'll jump into the next one. Do I win it? Okay. Oh, look out. It's cooked it. Thank you. Um, the reflectance here, basically, the, here's the wavelengths of light, okay? So we can see that section, and you can see there's not much difference in colour between stressed and 
and healthy and stuff. So green leaves here is a healthy plant. When it gets to the red edge, just out of visible light range, suddenly the reflectance value goes through the roof. And near infrared captures it nicely. That's why we look at near infrared as a health value. Also, a stress plant, we get a bit of a spike as well. And near infrared looks well. And bare earth is kind of a flat line. So we want to capture and measure that that variation and, and you can see it's quite a rapid change here that sort of 680 nanometers through to 740 it's that's where the rapid rate of change happens and that's where you can react as a farmer once it gets to here you're happy but by the time it gets to there you're in trouble so a lot of specialty cameras just focus on the green red red edge and near infrared that's what those band bands are all about so there's two ways to kind of measure this um let me jump a slide <coughs> the, on the left is just your standard digital camera, modified camera that you can buy to plug onto your Phantom or, or Inspire or whatever someone's trying to sell you. And here's the actual sensors. So they're, they're red, green, uh, um, red, green and blue normally and they've taken the red filter out and turned it into near infrared. And they're big wide bands so that they're capturing a lot of reflectance. Could be rocks or whatever you want, not necessarily chlorophyll. A dedicated multi-spectral camera has really narrow bands in the green, the red, near infrared, and then our, our, our red edge in the middle there. So these things are dedicated to just really ref measuring reflectance of chlorophyll. You're trying to focus it down. Uh, we'll jump one more. So I use this picture because this is actually a bad model. See, why it matters is, see all that darkening in there? And can you see all those lines? That's, that's artifacts of the camera. That, that's bad camera settings and, and cloud. So if you've got a camera of measuring things you can't see, when you look at it, how do you know you're not actually just measuring cloud change or wind picking up in the crop and laying the leaf over and reflecting differently? How do you actually know you're actually measuring chlorophyll, not just cloud? So it does happen, so you can't trust everything. And, and one of the key steps that's happened is people have modified an end, a, a camera, one of those wideband cameras, modified it for NDVI. And my business partner is a commercial pilot and owns a chicken shop. And I'd show him an NDVI map from five years ago, and he'd say, it looks no different to a red-green, you know, it looks no different to a colour map. There's nothing I can't see. And it's because the images weren't being corrected or calibrated or accounted for. And because the boom has been so fast and there's been so much money, well, um, so much money thrown at the scene that, um, just jump forward to, I don't think I can do it. Yeah, that one. Um, the sensor tech hadn't caught up. And UTAS has a great research crew doing exactly this, doing the sensors. But... A signal correction, so to counteract cloud and sunlight and stuff, has been an essential step that didn't exist in drones. The, the data wasn't there as such. Um, you're basically measuring cloud and wind and stuff. So unless you flew on a bright sunny day or a pure overcast day, it wasn't really telling you much different that you couldn't see with the naked eye. So, gee, I'm battling with this damn pointer. Um, Spectrally accurate NDVI maps are a pretty critical thing, I think. And it's the, literally the best one that got released for drones at the moment only came out in November. We pre-ordered it in August and we started flying it in November. And um, we did about 4,000 hectares with it. And this is a poppy crop. And you can see the red area is dead, the yellow is thriving. A lot going wrong in there, isn't there? Now, you as a farmer with your poppy crop, you know, maybe it's 3,000, 4,000 or 5,000 bucks a hectare, you've got to go and make decisions on what you're going to do in here and implement stuff. You, you want to be pretty confident in, in understanding that data and what's going on before you implement it. And secondly, can you implement it? So is it really red and dead or stressed or growing well? You know, these are all things that need validation and that's why accuracy becomes critical. So I think if you're trying to push the system hard, accuracy matters, okay? If you want to layer data and build up a precision ag workflow, accuracy is important, both in GPS and in cameras and sensors that you use. Um, distorted images. Okay, there's a couple of guys here I know that do make their own maps and they can take a distorted image and they do damn good things with it. They're really cluey switched on leading edge farmers that are doing it. Uh, I'm not really one of them. But, um, you know, they're rare as rocking horse manure. You know, they're few and far between. The, the bulk of farmers can, can look at that map and they already know what they're seeing and the line they drew around by hand would be just as good. They just didn't have to fly a drone and upload it to some program and get the map back. They already know it. So if you want to drive that precision ag workflow and outcomes, it's, it's not a silver bullet, it's fraught with risk, but you can do it. So the last summary, the old shearing handpiece, what the hell is that doing there? So there's a few sheep farmers in the room, I gather. You've all got handpieces. 
So I think of a drone like a shearing handpiece. Um, do you shear all your sheep with, because you own a handpiece? Do you feel you have to, you know? Are you better off spending your time shearing the sheep or keeping the sheep up and doing the drenching and backlining and stuff and getting them out and back into their paddocks and then keeping the handpiece to do other jobs like dagging a truckload of lambs on Sunday night before the truck goes or crutching a few sheep? You know, a drone is no different than a handpiece in how you think about how you use it. You, are you trying to run the whole production job, do the big shearing job, boom, like that, look at me? Or do you want something that will <clears throat> make Sunday afternoon slightly quicker than a hand shears and sharpening? You know, that's, that's how you've got to sort of look at drones, I think. So, in conclusion, um, you know, you've got to understand what people are trying to sell you. There's so much advertising going on around drones right now that are promising well beyond what they say they are, that what they can deliver, what's actually possible. And I hope I've given you a bit of confidence there to, to understand a bit more about what's going on and maybe ask some questions and probe the shiny salesman coming to try and sell you a drone pack. Um, I think you've got to use professional service providers if you want to drive precision ag in your farm. It is, it is a very specialised sport. I mean, we're a drone operator, flying is 20% of the workflow, and we collaborate with a number of guys in the room, service providers, and we collaborate with everyone in Tassie. There's no threat to our business. It's getting farmers to value our work, you know, the, the price of how much a map costs. How many times have you pushed your luck with a spray and a bit of rain coming or a bit of wind, you know? The, the, where you make that price point and value on it, I think, if you want to do precision ag, you've got to value that professional service because it, it is hard. And I think the biggest thing is make sure you can do something with the data. I mean, we, we did a lot of data last year and a lot of people just opened the file once and looked at it and 20% of our clients never actually opened the file. So, you know, it sort of tells you sometimes that um, not necessarily everyone wants to chase this and it, it is something you've got to chase and drive yourself to, to really work. And, it, yeah, a lot of questions to ask. And I think ask widely around your network, people who are doing things, and learn, listen and, and evolve with it because I tell you, it's, it's no walk in the park. But um, yeah, thank you very much for your time.